So tonight I'm going to be talking about Passover and how it actually is the beginning of first fruits. Okay? Something that we really haven't understood before. I haven't heard or seen anybody speak on this. But hopefully after tonight we'll have a little better understanding about how these things go together from a scriptural standpoint and why it is necessary for Passover to be part of this season of first fruits that we are in. There we go. All right. So probably all the people in the room and many of you at home as well probably remember the Art Linkletter show. And he did a bit that went on to become a show in and of itself where he would bring in children of various ages, generally somewhere between five and 10 years of age. Uh, because children in that age category are very quick to tell you what comes across their mind without filtering it, and children would say the darndest things. So, what, what we learn from that is that they clearly see what is going on around them, but they don't always understand it. And that lack of understanding as they try to fill in the details themselves in order to provide an explanation for the things that they're seeing without understanding can be quite humorous. And it's important to recognize that, that we do that even today, okay? As adults, whether we are listening to something or whether we're reading something, what we actually do is filter our hearing in our reading through our expectations of what it is that we think we are going to be reading and hearing. And so we will literally skip over words, we will change words in the sentence, we will hear things differently than what they were actually said if they don't agree with what it is that, that we have believed that things were going to be. And when that happens, when you take the various pieces of the puzzle and you put them together, but the puzzle pieces are not quite right, even though you have made a picture out of them, it doesn't always show up as, as sense. Sometimes it is nonsensical. You mean that's not an accurate picture? It may not be. This is very accurate. <laughs> or maybe not. A little cat with a pig nose and owl forehead. And it's amazing what you can fill the details in, in your mind to come up with things. And uh, we have 2,000 years of Christianity that have done just these sorts of things. Uh, thus, we have a Good Friday uh, and a celebration there of the death of Christ, when, in fact, there was no crucifixion on a Friday. It, it had to be on the Wednesday if Scripture was going to be fulfilled. And God fulfills the scriptures. So that's not the only misunderstanding that we have. And when you look at those things that are surrounding the appointments of God, and that's one of the first ones. I didn't include it on the list because the list was getting long. There could have been other terms we would include there that I speak about regularly. But the Hebrew word korban often gets, well, almost exclusively gets mistranslated as offering. The word hag gets mistranslated as feast. So does moed, but neither of these words means feast. There is a word in Hebrew for feast, but it's not used in conjunction with these. The word menka is translated either as bribe uh, in the more scholarly circles, or as grain offering or food offering in most of the translations that we have. Neither of these are correct. And then we have the wonderful word Kippur. We have Yom Kippurim in the fall, which we change to Yom Kippur, but it truly is Yom Kippurim. And this word gets translated as propitiation. And the concept of atonement has taken on the meaning of propitiation. However, a pro is before, and appitiation is a bribe. So propitiation is a bribe ahead of time. And I will just tell you that you're not going to be able to bribe God 
ahead of time, during the time, or after the fact. That's just the way it is. And this, this poor understanding and poor translations can then lead to some really odd pictures, right? And they're pictures that people take and put together to try to make sense of things, and yet they truly have misrepresented the Word of God, and they have not come up with the correct picture. So tonight I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a more appropriate picture. When we talk about korban, that word in the Hebrew means approach. And it's a, an approach unto Adonai. And it's an approach that is provided by Adonai. Now you can start to see one of the big issues right off the bat. If I am bringing an offering unto God, right, as opposed to he has provided to me an approach unto him, right, I literally have turned things on their ear already. And so that difficulty continues. In the case of Chag, it means to celebrate, and it means to celebrate unto God. When we think of this in terms of feasts, feasts are things that people get together. We have the Easter feast, we have the Christmas feast, we have feasts at other times of the year, right? And they're variable. People decide to come or they don't decide to come. But when God says that you will celebrate unto me at specific times, at specific places, in specific ways, we should take him serious about that. When we look at the Minka, the Benka means present. But when we look at what is presented to us in chapter 2 of Leviticus, the chapter about the Menka, what we find, and we'll look at this a little bit more in detail in a few minutes, what we find is that it is about the covenant. Right? The present is not a present that we bring. It's a present that God has given to us in the form of the covenant. And in fact, throughout that chapter and throughout the chapter preceding it about the ascent approach, what we in our pagan terminology call a burnt offering, it talks about how it is God himself who gleefully and joyfully cancels the debt and accepts these things. Not because we did them right, but in spite of the fact that we did them incorrectly and weren't capable of bringing them in the way that he would have us bring them. The last one, Kippur. The original understanding of the, the word at one meant, which got changed in, in the way it was pronounced to atonement, right? When we talk about atonement, if I have insulted my wife, I may run by Costco to get some flowers, going to get the extra big two dozen roses to atone for the insult or the, the slight that, that I may have done. And that's our understanding of atonement. And truly there, it is a bribe. Maybe it's not a bribe ahead of time. And maybe it's a bribe after the fact, but it's still a bribe. That was not the, what the, the word Kippur meant in the Hebrew. The concept was making at one. The picture is to take bit human, naturally occurring asphalt, and to laminate together in order to form one out of several pieces. Harken back to the book of, of John. And when Yeshua says that he wants us to be one with him, one with the Father, one with the Holy Spirit, and that our pathway for doing that is keeping his covenant. Right? Even in the New Testament, these ideas continue. So, what we're going to do is we're going to look at scriptures tonight and talk about Pesach and talk about how it is the opening salvo, a necessary uh, opening salvo unto first fruits. And in fact, though we tend to separate it and think about it separately, it cannot be separated from the rest of first fruits. And what is required at first fruits requires the Passover requires the Pesachal um, Korban, the Pesachal approach. 
John chapter 12, verse 24 tells us, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a kernel of grain falls into the earth and dies, it dwells alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Christ is speaking specifically here about the Passover, about his impending death that will come at the cross. Chapter 12 of John is at the Last Supper, and that's what he is speaking to. And this concept of this ripened grain that has to be dropped in is necessary in order to proceed uh, in the... Uh, thank you for removing that. That's getting a little troublesome for me as well. Um, the ripening of the grain is to be planted, to be put into the grave, to be put into the ground so that it would bear fruit is a concept that, that is tied to the matzah, which is tied to the first fruits. And so I'm going to show you how that goes together. When we look at John chapter 19, verse 30, uh, starting at, at uh, verse 28, for clarity, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there so that they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop's branch, interesting parallel, not an accident, and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. So at the very moment of him giving up his spirit, he literally had brought to complete fruition and completeness the works that God the Father had laid upon him in order to be that Pasako lamb. Right? And you can think of that as that ripe, fully ripened kernel of, of barley that, or wheat, but probably barley, that had to be placed into the grave. Okay, without that, you don't get another crop. So let's look at this further. And let's think about the matzo. Now, those of you that have looked at the four questions, this will look familiar. I'm going to condense a little bit of that on the matzo. We have this difference between matzo that we use at Passover and matzo that is used at other times of the year. They look the same. If you were to, to look at the piece of matzah, there would be no way for you to visually tell that it's any different than the matzah that, that you have at other times of the year. But there is a very significant difference. You see, when you take the, the wheat or barley and you bring it together with any kind of moisture, including the moisture that is left in the grain after it is harvested, it will become leaven. There's an enzyme that works with the moisture to begin that leavening process. And in fact, that, that uh, wheat or barley will go bad if it was harvested too early. It still has a moisture content. That's why you have to wait until the moisture content is low enough or if it hasn't been dried sufficiently. And the difference between the two is the amount of time that it takes to prepare. Matzah that's prepared, that's parv uh, kosher, that's kosher for Passover, is prepared in, from beginning to end in less than 18 minutes. Anything that's left longer than that is still matzah, but it's not parv, it's not kosher for Passover. It is kosher, but it's not kosher for Passover because it will, by its very nature, have chamats. Hmm. So that means that, the, that unless it is unleavened bread for Passover, it has chamats in it, which you are prohibited from eating this week. All right. Well, John chapter 4, verse 34 to 36, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me, and to finish to perfection, that's the, the word, the, the, the translation that you would get from the Greek, his work, that would be God's work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for the eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may rejoice together. 
Christ, of course, is talking about himself as the one who is going to reap the harvest. And as he is making disciples and, and taking in the people that God has sent to him, right, he is indeed changing them from what they were to what they will be. Right? But it's this finished work that has to be completed at the cross before we can move into Chag Matzah. John chapter 17, verses 4 to 5. Here Yeshua is lifting up the prayer for the disciples so that, the, that they would understand what it is that he wants for them. And he says, I glorified you on earth. He's talking about God the Father, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So again, he's talking about these accomplished works where once he lays down his, his life, as he says in the Latin, fini, it is finished. John chapter 12, verse 24. Uh, again, I would point out, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a, a kernel of grain falls into the earth and dies, it dwells alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. That fruit is you and I. And we too, as we will see, our first fruits. John chapter 19, verse 28 to 30. Uh, after this, Jesus, knowing all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst, a jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on his hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. Uh, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the spirit. Okay, Luke chapter 22, verse 37. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me, and he was numbered with the transgressions. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. Again, this concept that everything that scripture has said has got to be fulfilled. Right? And this is a, an important piece. When we look at Isaiah chapter 52, this is the end of Isaiah 52, and we'll move right into Isaiah 53. Notice that it says, starting in verse 13, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him for that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. Continuing into verse uh, 1 of 53. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken, for the transgressions of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Deuteronomy chapter 16 verses 1 to 3 says, Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God, for in the month of Abib the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And you shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or from the herd at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. 
You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. Well, Scripture's not just talking about coming out of Egypt. In fact, it's talking about coming out of the world, coming out of sin. What we are called to do in celebrating the unleavened bread is to celebrate the fact that Yeshua was willing to lay down his, his, his life and to pay the price that we could not pay. We are called to remember all seven days how he was afflicted. And that's what the Chag Matzah is truly about. Remember that the Passover starts with that, that seed that has come to full fruition. It has to be completely unleavened. It had to have been completely dried and ready to go into the ground because if there had been any moisture with it, it would have leavened itself. Christ is that unleavened seed that gets placed into the ground and from which we get the hog matzah, the bread of our affliction. And so Passover, <coughs> excuse me, Passover naturally moves into this bread of affliction but it doesn't stop there. In the midst of the Hag Matzah, all of a sudden we have something completely different that will be offered. And here, unlike the Passover sacrifice that did not come with a menka, did not come with any, any indication of the, the covenant that God is going to enter into with man. On first fruits, there's a menka that's very different from the menkas of every other day of the year. So let's talk about how that is. The menkas, chapter 2 of Leviticus, of Vyakra, and it is required to be made of wheat every single day of the year, with the exception of first fruits. And on first fruits, it's required to be made from something very special. And we'll talk about that momentarily. When we look at the ingredients for the menka, the ingredients are unleavened, which would represent God the Father, oil, which would represent God the Holy Spirit, and the wheat, which represents God the Son, hearkening back to the manna. And in fact, the minka, the bread and the wine, the nesek, together are part of a covenantal meal that's required. The present that is being provided is provided not by us unto God, but by God unto us as he provides to us a covenant that is an approach unto God. You see, this isn't just the Menka, it's the Menka Korban. It's the approach through the covenant that God has made so that there would be a way to bring us Panim al Panim unto him. It's brought with salt, which represents faith, and with frankincense, which represents prayer. And the only time that the Menka is brought is with with sacrifices that are specific for having kept the covenant. Sin offering, trespass offering, no menka. Why? Because we've been faithless. The Pesach, no menka. Why? Because the Lamb of God would take on your sin and my sin to make a way possible, to make an approach for us that was not there unless he completing all of his works, the works that God had given him, would make a way for us. All right. Well, that's the men call 364 days of the year. 
What about, well, let's talk about how that's brought. It's always brought with the ascent approach. Um, the ascent approach also, when you look at chapter one, we, in pagan parlance, we call it a, a burnt offering, um, but it is an approach, an ascent approach unto God, like you would make an approach onto a mountaintop. Um, that approach, again, is an approach like onto a harbor or onto an airport. The interesting thing here is that the requirements that are placed both upon what is being offered to be both tamim and lomum, those are two different things. They get translated poorly, uh, well, completely mistranslated in the scripture to be the same thing. And the only time that, that there's any kind of differentiation is when they both show up in the same sentence. But otherwise, tamim, which means flawless from a moral standpoint, and lo moon, which means not having any blemishes that would also have occurred due to a moral sort of issue, those two requirements are placed not just upon the red heifer, but upon every single offering that is to be brought. And just as it took, we were waiting for our 10th red heifer over the course of more than, than 3,500, 3,400 years, right? Each and every one of the ascent approaches had to be both Lomum and Tamim. But wait, it gets worse than that because maybe I could find something that might be close. Problem is, is there's a requirement for you and for me if we are to be priests of God, which we are all called to be, to be both Tamim and Lomum. And there's not a single one of us that will either meet that criteria to be able to bring the offering or find an offering that we could bring. Now, God, however, says that if we step out in faith to do what it is that he says he will do, his word says that he will gleefully and joyfully accept it and cancel the debt that we cannot pay. Right? That he will make us at one. Right? If this was atonement from the standpoint of bribing, why would we have to bribe God when we were doing the right thing? And you can start to see where these, these terminologies just do not work. All right. So again, this is an approach unto God through the covenant. And truly, the present that God has given us, the mincha that God has given us, is the fact that he has made an approach unto us through a covenant that he has given to us, which we violate. And yet he's still going to make a way possible. So what's the difference then between all 364 days of the year and this special menka that is brought on the day of first fruits? Well, it's not wheat. It's made out of barley. And it's not just barley. It's barley that hasn't ripened yet. It is aviv barley. The aviv barley is a pollinated form of the plant. It contains no starch. If you plant it, it will not grow anything in its form. You cannot eat it. it. It's worthless. And yet, if you take it and you transform it by fire as you were required to do on this day, then you can make from it a minka that you're required to bring on this day out of the roasted groats, out of the roasted aviv barley. Now, the aviv barley comes from the field and it is processed, and then that mincha is brought uh, a little bit later in the day. And it looks different than the regular unleavened bread that is brought. And it is different, because here it has been transformed. And that transformation becomes the important key piece. This omer of the first fruits, again, is waved before Adonai, a wave offering and a heave offering, again, horrible translations. We combine the two. We don't differentiate between the two. A heave offering, only that which is heaved is holy unto God. A wave offering, not only is what is heaved holy, but everything that it came from is holy as well. Meaning that the holiness that Christ provided when he was accepted as the wave offering for you and I, as it says in Leviticus chapter 23, is for the acceptance of you. That's you and that's me. Not for the crop. 
Again, it's roasted over the fire to make groats. They then grind it up to make this barley minka. And then they bring that according, uh, along with the single um, lamb or goat that was required to be brought. It could be brought from either one. We'll, we'll get into more details on this one on Sunday. Boys brought with the nasek, which is the Shema concept, the obedience concept. All right, and again, this Aviv barley was required to be brought on first fruits. Now, today we have a calculated calendar, but historically, when they approached the month of Aviv, if there was not going to be Aviv barley at the time that it was required for them to bring it, they would insert another month so that there would be. Okay, the Karite Jews today still follow a calendar where they look at the moon for that new crescent in the western sky, but they also go by the presence of sufficient quantities of the Aviv barley to be able to bring that on the, um, during the, the week of unleavened bread. And if they don't, they, they will insert a month. Okay? Recognize that, that it is this Aviv barley that sets the calendar. Right? It's the resurrection of Christ that sets the calendar. Right? You have to have the death, but, you, but the resurrection is there too. All right. In a time of Moses, with the death of the firstborn, Pharaoh finally, after having, have, after having hardened his own heart, and then when he was ready to, to relinquish, having God hardened his heart, uh, so that, that the fullness of, of God could be displayed to the world, at that point, the death of the firstborn has occurred, of man and beast, and Pharaoh says, get them out of here. Right? And scripture is really clear. It's by a mighty hand and an outstretched arm that God takes the Hebrews out of Egypt, as if on eagles' wings. They didn't want to go. Three nights and three days later, as the sun is going down and Pharaoh is in the wadi, just chomping at the bit to try to get at them and to kill the Hebrews and to take them back into slavery. And only by the pillar of fire, which has set itself up in that wadi, have they been kept safe. And the people are clamoring. They're upset. They think Moses has dragged them out into the wilderness so that they could be killed out here. Well, they could have been killed in Egypt. And they said that to them. But three nights, three days later, is when God tells Moses to tell the people to stand still, pay attention, and watch the Yeshua of the Lord, the salvation of the Lord. Likewise, three nights and three days after the death of Christ on the cross, when he laid down his life, he picked it back up again as he said he had the power to do. Not a coincidence. First day of the week. The Gospel of John tells us in this conversation that occurs in the beginning parts of chapter 3, uh, Nicodemus comes to Yeshua at night and they're talking and Yeshua is trying to open his eyes. You know, Nicodemus starts the conversation with good teacher, we know that you must be from God because of the things that you're doing. And Yeshua is polite to him and says, well, you must not be far from things since you're seeing that. And they enter into this conversation that, that Yeshua tells him that unless he is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is incredulous. Well, what am I going to do? Crawl up inside my mother's womb again? How can this be? Well, Yeshua then chastises him for being one of the great teachers of Israel and not understanding the spiritual aspects of things. And he says, says to him, unless you are born again from above by water and from above by the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right? This picture of Israel into the Red Sea and out the other side, that picture of baptism, is a picture of the rebirth from above by God into something different. They literally have been transformed. They were a possession of Pharaoh. 
And now they are a possession of God. They were part of Egypt, but now they've been transformed and they are a nation unto themselves. That transformation is what this is about, and it's the transformation that Christ undergoes too, from cold, lifeless flesh on a slab of stone to life and life everlasting. It's the transformation that is promised to each and every single one of us in Leviticus chapter 23. The proof that he was accepted was that he was seen by thousands. And that's proof that you and I will be accepted, as it says there as well. So that special men, men call that comes with first fruits. We then enter into the 50 days of the counting of the Omer, often overlooked. Uh, we have our rabbinic friends that, that tend to keep this, but everybody else just kind of moves past it. And in fact, many of our Christian brothers and sisters don't even bother with the culmination of this, which is, Shavuot, or what they would call Pentecost. It has become nothing more than the birth of the church, which is a lie from the pit of hell. The church was already doing well and good, and frankly, if you are not grafted into Israel, you will have no part of the kingdom. That's not me, that's scripture. And that's what Yeshua also says. You have Exodus chapter 16, verse 4, which says specifically that over this time frame, and in fact, today, God daily will test us whether or not we will walk in his laws or not. Yeshua says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah. God the Father, God the Son agree on this. And then, of course, we have Shavuot on the 50th day. And this first fruits of Shavuot is a first fruits that is actually a completed crop. It's not like the Aviv barley that's brought that is the pollinated form. It's the fully ready to harvest form of the wheat. Interestingly, it doesn't come out of the fields. It comes out of the homes. Right? The whole point of this, the only way that you can get from Pasak up to Shavuot is through this concept of first fruits, right? With the understanding that, that what had to be completed and then the transformation that comes above that in first fruits, that these are tied together, <laughs> that, that you cannot have a resurrection without a death. You cannot have a death without the seed being into the ground. You cannot have a death without the fullness of what scripture had said coming to pass. And you can't separate these two. That in fact, that seed that is spoken of in Pesach is that first step in the season of first fruits. Remember at Shavuot, we have the giving of the law. And... 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, we have the giving of the Holy Spirit, right? And that's a token of what we will have, right? The promise wasn't just that we would, would have the Holy Spirit with us and go through life and eventually die and go on. The promise of first fruits of the Aviv barley is a transformed life. Just as Christ was transformed into life, life everlasting, we have that promise as well. We currently have the Holy Spirit, but eventually we will have glorified bodies. And God himself says that he will cause us to walk in his Torah at that time. Hmm. All right, well, let's look at this a little bit more. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 8. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. 
Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we test about, testify about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. James chapter 1 verses 16 to 18 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his, own will he, uh, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Here's that concept of you and I as first fruits. Revelations drives us home as well. No one could learn the song, and this is Revelations chapter 14, verses 3 to 5, except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. This season that we're in is the season of first fruits. It began on Wednesday with the death, the celebration of the death of our Lord and Savior. It continues through this week of Hag Matzah, not just any matzah, but the matzah that is truly unleavened to the point of, of being kosher for Passover having fulfilled completely all that scriptures had said was required. And then, in the midst of that, we have this transformation in the menka, this covenant of God that has been given to us as a present, of which Christ himself is that present. His res resurrection proving that you and I will have resurrected bodies, proving that you and I will be accepted before God the Father. Proof that you and I have a hope that the world does not have. And that begins a required time of counting the Omer. I'll go into that in more detail at a later time. But it's a time of, of sanctification for those that God has called to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Because really, that's what it is about. God did not just die for us so that we could continue on the path that we had been on, but that we would be pulled out from the sins in which we lived, and that we would be made more and more holy, more and more conformed to the image of Christ, that we would be first fruits unto God and unto the Lamb. So as we continue in this season, as we approach Sunday, which is the day of first fruits of the Aviv Barley. I do encourage you to, to join us uh, at 1017 that morning and, and to learn more about the specifics of that day. 
and its importance. We have much of our Christian brothers and sisters that are celebrating Easter. Easter is not first fruits. You change the name of things and the names are important. You change the date of things. Our Jewish friends have, have moved that are rabbinic, have moved first fruits from the day of the first day of the week in Hag Matzah to the 16th of Aviv, the day after the High Sabbath that starts Hag Matzah. And neither of these things are correct. What we seek to do is to walk in the steps of Yeshua and to do as he did and to follow him. Amen? Amen. Uh, my hope is that you've enjoyed this evening, this Arab Shabbat with us. Uh, we look forward to joining with you tomorrow in fellowship, uh, even if it's virtual fellowship. Uh, we know that like the centurion who came to Yeshua and did not need Yeshua to come to him so that, that he knew that when Yeshua gave the word, that the word would be given. Can we bring that down, please, just a little bit? We're getting a lot of feedback. That when the centurion came to Yeshua, that he knew that he didn't need Yeshua to come with him. He knew, being a man under authority, that all that was required was for Yeshua to speak the word and that Yeshua's will would be done. That it didn't matter the distance that was between them, but that when God spoke it, it would be. And so we also depend on that. We know that even though we are apart, that in Christ there is unity. And so again, we invite you to enjoy uh, our Shabbat service tomorrow. Uh, join us at 1017, and we will see you then. Now when the children of the Lord were gathered together, God instructed Aaron to give this blessing, that the name of the Lord would be upon them. Yivo reka Adonai vishmareka Yair Adonai panavaleka vikuneka Yisa Adonai panavaleka Via sim leka shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you peace, the peace of the Shar Shalom. Good night, everybody. Blessings to you. And again, join us tomorrow for our Shabbat service at 1017 and again on Sunday for our first fruit service at 1017. Blessings.